A newcomer wants to get his wings. I see the sky, I see freedom. I see the freedom to go anywhere you want in the world and to express yourself however you want. Aviation is bouncing back and looking to a sustainable future. In the ocean, change is also coming. Coral reefs are getting a helping hand. It is exciting times for marine science research in Singapore. The underwater world holds colorful secrets. Meet the scientists and volunteers working to create a blue future. At the 2022 Singapore Air Show, the regional head of Airbus is doing the rounds. I've been passionate about aviation since I was a child and I've just been following my dreams to pursue a career in aviation. It's very exciting for me to see all the people around me and the planes again back here. These are tentative signs of normality for an industry battered by COVID-19. As a leading aviation hub, Singapore took a hard hit. The industry wants to leave behind memories of planes parked in the Australian outback. The Singapore Air Show is a very special moment for me because when I was at the last Singapore Air Show, I saw the pandemic just start. And, and to start to close all the borders. This air show, I'm hoping, is the milestone for the end of the pandemic and the beginning of a bright future, not just for aviation, but for freedom of movement. The demand is there, the demand is bubbling, and it's ready to really grow and come out. Getting ready for that demand is Zakir Hamid. Good morning, guys. The former Singapore Air Force pilot now oversees the largest Airbus flight crew training centre in the world. While you can ground aircraft and put them in long-term storage, the same can't be said for pilots. They need to maintain their proficiency, and this requires consistency in their training. Thank you. Singapore Airlines pilots and trainers Patrick Fan and Benson O oh are putting the newest A350 simulator through its paces. It will help train and retrain pilots as aviation rebounds. Ready, Patrick? Ready. Take off. Heathrow Tower, good morning. Singapore 35, contact Heathrow Tower. First up is a simulated landing in snowy conditions in London. Landing clearance, obtain runway 27 left. Minimum visual, continue. 7, 60, left. Flag, 30. All break off, check. Manual braking, check. Thank you. A couple of years back, on the 350, I flown into Heathrow, London. It was a snowy night, uh, cold and uh, gusting wind. And whatever we have been uh, trained in the simulator, we put, put it to good use. And believe me, uh, this is quite the real thing. And what is essential is for pilots to be able to use these scenarios, repeat them and practice them. And why is it so? Because this builds confidence and reflexes in pilots so that when the real emergencies occur, we can be assured that they know how to respond in order to keep the flight safe and the passengers as well safe. Takeoff clearance. Obtain. Obtain before takeoff check is complete. Check. Ready, Patrick? Ready. Take off. Next is a simulated bird strike on takeoff. 
Hundred dollar. Stop. I need to stop. Attention, cabin crew at station. Engine two, fire push button push. Okay, Benson, the fire extinguish confirm. Confirm fire ex extinguish. Please uh, check with ATC. The center has also been helping pilots impacted by hard times. Pilots with Singapore qualifications, furloughed by overseas-based airlines, were given affordable simulator training to keep their licenses current. I think that the opportunity that was provided to them is a testament to the fact that not just AATC but Singapore is thinking about them it's thinking about how we can help them get back to work at some point in time in the near future. Uh, and as a pilot, that would mean a lot to me. To be a pilot, I think it takes curiosity, a sense of adventure. You need dedication, you need discipline, um, composure, especially when you have uh, or to be cool under pressure. And above all, I think you need the right kind of attitude. Uh, there's a saying, the right attitude, or at your attitude determines your altitude. At the nearby Salita Airport, Daryl Tan is seeing if he's got what it takes to be a pilot. He's an air traffic controller, taking part in an innovative program to learn flying. This is to better understand what pilots go through especially in emergencies. Okay, we need to take a look. But for Daryl, it has added significance. I joined the Singapore Youth Flying Club when I was in junior college because I wanted to be a fighter pilot and join the Air Force. But uh, unfortunately, due to my studies, I chose to leave the club so that I can uh, finish my junior college and my A-levels. Looking back now, it's been the greatest regret of my life. Coming back after so long to learn flying, it actually shows that I never gave up my dream. He's already done solo flights around the airport, but today he's practicing for a solo in Singapore's main training airspace. Both the reservoir is actually quite beautiful, the scenery, but most of the time for a student pilot, we are actually more focused on the performance of the aircraft and we are more focused on the in the cockpit, what's happening in the cockpit. Flying for me is actually full of challenges and the challenges is actually something that I wish to push myself forward to. So uh, that is the reason why I love flying so much. Victor Bravo Oscar Zulu request to rejoin back to If he stays on track his final exam and pilot's license are just a few months away. It's kind of daunting and scary because uh, if at this point in time, if you were to ask me, I'm actually still do not have the confidence to go for the exam yet, but I'm building up to it. My family and friends are very encouraging. And uh, as for safety, my parents uh, do have their concerns, but uh, they have full confidence that I will be able to take good care of myself. To me, when I see the sky, I see freedom. I see the freedom to go anywhere you want in the world and to express yourself however you want. It's another chapter in an aviation story that began just over a hundred years ago. March 1911, a flimsy canvas and wood plane struggled on its first flight at the old Singapore racetrack. By the third flight, it reached 500 feet and circled the grounds. The Belgian pilot even dropped a dummy bomb on a warship outlined in chalk. It missed, but otherwise the event was a success. There were hundreds of uh, spectators outside the race course, all flying, I mean, trying to see the, the aircraft in the air. The police had to come in to do crowd control. Aviation has arrived. Before long, the first plane landed from overseas. Air races between Europe and Australia stopped here, but it wasn't all clear skies. Flying in the early years was certainly a very dangerous affair. Torrential rains, zero visibility, and uh, without navigational aids, certainly uh, life were lost. 
civil aviation really took off when aircraft went from ocean landings to proper airfields. Kalang Airport opened and impressed pilots, including the world's most famous female aviator. Certainly for Amelia Earhart, who was flying around the world and passing through Singapore, having seen Kalang, she said that it is a miracle in the East. But time passed Kalang Airport by, although the terminal still stands today. The government wanted to stay ahead of booming demand and reap the economic rewards. It was replaced by Paya Labour for a few decades. And then land was reclaimed for Changi, setting the stage for the aviation powerhouse of today. Air transport is now linked to more than 11% of the country's GDP. When I look at the entire development and progress of aviation in Singapore, it's nothing short of amazing. From 1911, when the first flight took place, to what we are today as a very important aviation hub, not just for the region, but for the world, says a lot of how we plan ahead. The ecosystem that was being built up through the years. And that ecosystem is still evolving to stay ahead of competitors. Futuristic aircraft might be flying in Singapore sooner than most people realise. Singapore's Marina Bay. Drones carry parcels and dot the skies. Sharing the airspace are new types of passenger aircraft which look like a cross between a drone and a helicopter. Above them are zero emission jets. It's not currently a reality, but might be soon. A German company wants to be a part of that future, in Singapore and elsewhere. Volocopter recently tested its air taxi at two airports in Seoul. Staff from the company's Singapore office were on hand. The battery-powered aircraft has 18 rotors, making it quieter than a helicopter with zero emissions. Is this what regular urban transport will soon look like? In the Asian megacities um, in this region, we're seeing increasing urbanization, which leads to increased congestion. That also increases uh, environmental pollution. And in this era of heightened time sensitivity for business people, we see an urgent need for people uh, to, to make it to their meetings. So, so Hon, there you see how many media was there, actually, um, which was a great surprise Very for cool. us. Back in Singapore, the team briefs the boss on the trip to South Korea. We are very lucky with the weather. Uh, as you can see on the video, it was actually five minutes long flight. Uh, we did two loops around the airport environment. And this was being live streamed? Yes, so the audience. Yeah, he obviously is a very experienced pilot, so towards the end, uh, he showed off a little bit of his skills. He did an uh, incline 45 degrees forward, which is also uh, symbolized a bow. The aircraft will take off and land from so-called voloports located across cities. The Singapore service is planned to start as tourist flights from Marina Bay, but then expand. When we look at traffic congestion um, in Singapore, where we see we can add the most value um, is actually going cross-border, going outside of Singapore um, to our northern neighbours and to our southern neighbours. Singapore is vying with Paris to be the first city in the world to get the volocopter. A test flight in Singapore went well and the company insists it will launch here commercially before 2025. Initial flights will have a pilot, but are later planned to be autonomous to bring costs down. Things 
things are also changing with more traditional types of aircraft and airports. So when we start to look at the future, sustainability is the core of what the consumers are looking at, what the market is looking at. So aviation has to keep up. Any hub of the future has to commit to decarbonization. And we see Singapore committing to that in terms of innovation. And we are working with Singapore to work on infrastructure, especially around hydrogen, to look at a decarbonized air hub. Biofuels are also being tested, especially for long haul flights. But a lot of the excitement is around zero emission hydrogen. Several concepts and sizes are being evaluated. They plan to use liquid hydrogen to combust with oxygen, backed up by hydrogen fuel cells providing electricity. The emissions are water vapour. The company aims to finalise a design by 2025 and get the new plane in service by 2035. I think this is really something that, that's going to be a pleasure to see clean skies while we can go and travel and see our loved ones. But how will all the new types of aircraft be able to share the same airspace? The answer is taking shape with a set of special drones. Verified PBIT 001. Leo Jiu and his team are laying the groundwork for a new type of air traffic control system. We're starting to see these air taxis and unmanned cargo vehicles emerge now, and they're developing very rapidly, which means in the next five, 10 years, we'll see these vehicles in our air and for sure, they will need to be integrated with the airspace, with the manned aircraft. The real test comes in a new maritime drone estate. It's been set up to see which technology will work best in Singapore. A key challenge that we'll have in bringing ground transportation into the air is really the amount of flights. And with that, that's not something that a human being or a normal air traffic controller will be able to manage. The way to manage this is with technology, with digitalization. A telecom scanner is placed in the cargo area. Okay. SOC, automatic takeoff ready, standby. The first test is a stationary one. It's only to 200 feet but the team has been testing up to 1,000 feet. They're collecting data to see if 5G signals can maintain communications and show where the drones are at all times. The key concern is air collision risk between air vehicles and potentially also flying over the public. And in so doing, if we have any outages, any blanks in the data, this becomes a risk because you no longer know where the drones are. UA is now over deck. And this is the ultimate time for any scientist, for any engineer, because you get to see your thinking, your research being applied, and you get to see it being tested. So this is what makes it very interesting at this stage. The next flight tests distance. So far, the drone has been tested as far as three kilometers out to sea. They're hoping for solid results within months to provide a basic framework for the skies of tomorrow. Perfect flights. Yeah, we've managed to get two good flights in today to be able to get the data that we wanted. Excellent. So where is this really heading? I would hope that we're surprised less by the airspace, but more about our living environment. That the cities or mega cities of the future will have little or no roads. You now, more of a coexistence between greenery and architecture as land transportation moves up into the air. This is something that will be great as we see this sort of future. If you're working in this area, 
you can be very proud of that you'll be working on something that would potentially have a big impact and bring about a better future. From the blue of the sky to the blue of the ocean, there's also change happening beneath the waves. Can the mistakes of the past be rectified? Off Singapore's southern coast, a new Navy vessel is being tested. It's checking on another boat. What makes it different is that there's no one on board. It's an unmanned surface vessel, or USV. It's being deployed because of increasing maritime threats and demographic reality. So given that Singapore's a declining birth rate, manpower will likely be a problem, and this uh, problem is here to stay. So uh, having the unmanned vessels, we can uh, free up uh, a lot more manpower and we can then channel these manpowers to uh, other areas of our Navy, which is more manpower intensive. The vessel can patrol 24 hours a day, on the lookout for piracy, illegal immigrants and non-state threats. It is uh, fast, it is agile. Though it is 60 metres, you know, it is really like a sci-fi uh, in reality, because the amount of uh, technology packed into this craft is uh, really uh, not easy. Cameras and radar help it see. The brain inside the vessel is a processor, using software that had to be developed locally. So the key thing about our Singapore waters is that they're very, very, very busy. Incredibly busy, in fact. And I think uh, most commercially available uh, autonomous navigation providers, when they come down to Singapore, they will be shocked and amazed by how busy our waters are. So to give it some context, in any given point in time, we have about a thousand vessels in Singapore, uh, Singapore waters. And these aren't small speedboats, these are large container vessels. You know, To date, no other market offerings can do what we've done, mostly because of Singapore's uh, busy and congested waters. The software was put through millions of kilometres of lab simulations to check it was safe before sea trials. So what we did was we spoke to the users, of course, to figure out what their everyday tasks were like, what sort of uh, patrols they do, what they, how they react in certain situations. So to capture that into robotics, we have to break that down into individual elementary actions and then code that accordingly. The USV approaches another boat which does not get out of the way. The vessel's onboard processor communicates with the propulsion system to initiate collision avoidance. In the control room, a team of just two can oversee the vessel and plan its patrols. So I had a quick conversation with one of my uh, NSF uh, operator. He was uh, very happy and excited when he see the console. You know, to him, uh, his exact remark was that it's like uh, playing computer game at home. You know, with such a uh, user-centric uh, consideration, uh, with uh, click and drag functions, with shortcut keys. You know, he, he just felt at home. There's more testing to be done before a fleet of the vessels is deployed. And they won't be the last of their kind. I guess the waters in Singapore will only get uh, busier uh, in the time to come. Uh, I also believe that the unmanned technology will be the way ahead. You know, and with all this, I guess we will be able to see a more unmanned uh, technology out there along the Singapore streets. Uh, so watch out for it. But defence comes in many forms. The land meets the sea in the hard armour of seawalls. They account for more than 65% of Singapore's coastline. A professor and students from a marine ecology lab are on Sentosa Island trying to soften the walls a bit and help a marine ecosystem that's taken a battering. Hard coastal defences is the first 
uh, point of call for uh, engineers when they're trying to defend coastlines. But unfortunately, they do not support the same kind of biodiversity as a natural shoreline. This is the world of ecological engineering. The team has brought along its latest design. They are concrete tiles that recreate the hiding places small creatures use in natural shorelines when the tide goes in and out. Let me, let me fill in this space over here first. We're aiming to encourage colonization by algae, uh, uh, all sorts of different kinds of algae, uh, which brings in grazes. We also get various crustaceans, particularly crabs, coming to live on the tiles. Although some of the species which come in inhabit the enhancement tiles are not very charismatic in themselves, they play important roles in the larger ecosystem. They're part of the, the greater food web and they uh, provide uh, resources for uh, many marine fish and reptiles. Some of the students took a while to see the value in this less glamorous side of science. And they've all developed you know, a wide range of skills related to this, which uh, they probably didn't expect to learn. So I, I joke with them that if they, you know, if they can't find a job as a marine biologist afterwards, they can always go into uh, construction or renovation. The impact on the coast actually goes back centuries. Singapore became a hub for the coral trade in the early 1800s. It also experienced overfishing. The first land reclamation was in the early 19th century, but truly accelerated from the mid 20th century, with Singapore adding more than 20% to its total area. The coastal ecosystem paid the price for the dazzling development. But the team is focused on the future, and it's now the leading one of its kind in the tropics and we're very sure that our tiles work. Many other countries are also building coastal defences, again, uh, to protect them from sea level rise, and we're very keen to share our solutions with our neighbours. The work goes on into the night and over several days, but there is much more to come. We'd really like to see some uh, what we call hybrid coastal defences. So these would have the, the benefits of the hard coastal defences, basically a hard backstop, but also many more soft elements, which be more like a natural coastline. So this is the, the way forward, and this is what many of us are working towards at the moment. Another team is heading to a different island. They're not installing shelters for marine life, they're collecting them. The last three of 60 fish units in place for up to two years. So when I was younger, my dad used to bring the family to the beach for camping. When we were there, he will usually bring us to intertidal walks around the beach. And he will show us stuff like starfishes, crabs, octopus. And I guess that's where my spark or affinity for marine life develop. The destination is Kusu Island, one of more than 60 outlying islands in Singapore. Urshad and JJ will dive to retrieve the units. Uh, weather looks fine. The water is pretty choppy, but we're still going to go. Yeah. Let's go. Let's go. So we will scuba down to the units slowly and carefully to not scare away any of the organisms. We try our best. And once we are at the units itself, we will put over our nets over the whole units. And we tie a bungee cord at the bottom and then we lift it up and we double bag it with another net and we'll bring it back up to the boat. The process goes on for several hours. I 
think it's great. It's great that you get to see these changes and that the units themselves are maturing. It's amazing to know that from the start, we were a little unsure whether these organisms would actually colonize. It's a cowry, a type of snail. A sea squat. This is a sea squat. Yeah, and so it shows that it's a good alternative in case the coral reefs degradation proved to be worse than what we might expect. So unfortunately, these creatures are the first to succumb to environmental changes such as ocean acidification and increased temperature. We need to know what creatures are actually present in the waters of Singapore in the first place. So we need to study them and find ways to protect them. The samples are immediately brought to the lab for analysis. The team leader is a renowned marine biologist. Hard at work? Yep. <laughs> and what do you have here? Yep, so we've got some sea squids over here, we've got some shrimp, hermit crabs. And the reason why we do this is so that we don't actually have to damage the reefs to understand what lives within them. That's what's nice about this project. It allows us that insight. So how was the visibility today? The visibility wasn't that good. It's around one meter today. Because all these units were in the deep, right? Yeah. So it's true. Deeper up. areas. Okay. Are those spots uh, dirt or are they... Are they... I'm elated. I think this is exactly what we wanted to see. The hard part actually comes, you know, after the retrieval, when we're actually sorting through the organisms. Uh, some of the organisms that we've seen over the past months have been rare. So we have to say, for example, if this is a shrimp that we don't know, we have to consult a shrimp expert. Or a crab that we don't know, then we have to consult a crab expert. So it, now, once we're done with them, these specimens are actually available to scientists worldwide if they wanted to study them. So these are actually very, very important um, contribution to uh, our understanding of biodiversity at large. Trying to stop development is, is going to be very difficult. We are in a region where development on coastal systems and coastlines are rife. So if development cannot be stopped, then I think the next step would be mitigation. So this mitigation uh, ways would include the use of artificial structures to mimic the natural systems. I think over time, with uh, fast-paced development, we have forgotten that Singapore is an island and that we are islanders, right? So there's been, again, this reclaiming of our identity as we realise that, you know, there's blue spaces all around us and that has been a great revelation. And part of the blue spaces are coral reefs, where experts are hard at work. Can the waters be clear and healthy again to support them? Sisters Islands are Singapore's first marine park. Reefs in this area host more than 30% of the world's coral species. Sam Shu Chin and her colleagues are here to go on a monthly dive to check on hidden structures. Careful of our chins, so they might be on the structure oh, yeah. also. Okay. And also be aware of the current change. If the current is strong, then we just signal to each other and then we can go up. Yeah. So sometimes in a month, there's only two days that you can go and the uh, diving window can be really short, within two to four hours. And of course, there are times where we got stuck in the current and I tell you, it's really like you're in a washing machine spinning. They're checking on eight artificial reefs put in place here in late 2018. The exact location is not being shared so that the reefs have time to grow undisturbed. About a thousand corals were transplanted here. The team is documenting their growth 
but is also recording the natural arrival of corals and other marine life. The sea holds a lot of secrets, and once you learn scuba diving, it gives you the opportunity to unravel them one by one. So every time I go diving, it's really a surprise because you really don't know what to expect in the sea. And I love it because sometimes in Singapore, especially, it's like treasure hunting. It's so murky, and then once you find some marine animals, you get really excited. The corals are also doing really great. Some of them are even growing over the frame, which is also a good thing. And you can see different animals colonizing the artificial structures. So sometimes um, when you are lucky, you see octopus, you see fish. We have juvenile fish that are actually using the corals to hide. And you can actually see sponges, barnacles. They are colorful things that are actually colonizing the structures. The three-storey structures are among the largest of their kind in the world. It's hoped they'll teem with life in the years ahead. New designs will follow, even adding low-voltage electricity. This will help form a calcium carbonate skeleton to help corals grow faster. The scientists are building on best practices from elsewhere and adding their own twist. So we've got some world-renowned researchers uh, in Singapore doing research, cutting-edge research uh, that's uh, being published and referenced around the world. So um, it is exciting times for marine science research in Singapore. Ultimately, we're hoping that Singapore will become one of the uh, centres of excellence for marine research within the region. Nature needs a hand because of what humans have done in the past. Reclamation causes sedimentation, blocking light and sometimes burying corals. Average visibility has dropped from 10 metres in the 1960s to a couple of metres today. Given that all the coral reefs occupy less than 1% of the world's ocean, it is estimated that about 25% of the fish species that we eat have some direct link to coral reefs. And if you look at uh, the history of a lot of the islands, you find that islands that have good coral reefs protected from uh, the impacts of, say, strong waves uh, and storms. So having these structures along the coast builds resilience along the coastline. The team will continue its work in the years ahead to find the best way to help coral reefs thrive. One, two, three, up. Oh my God, the wind! In her spare time, Sam finds other ways to protect the blue world. She's volunteering with a community effort to clean up rubbish in the waterways along Singapore's northern coastline. This follows on from her work cleaning up rubbish from coral reefs. The team comes ashore in areas that can't be reached on foot. So the mangrove is here. So nice, right? Later I sing in, you must save me. Yay! <laughs> this is so heavy, Sabo. <laughs> So I do this other initiative outside my main job because I feel that all these are um, opportunities for me to engage the public in different ways for them to learn about our marine diversity, biodiversity and also the environmental issues that they can easily do some little changes in their life to make this whole place better. After a couple of hours, the kayakers head back with their haul. Sam estimates they've collected about 2,000 pieces of trash today. The cleanup is a sign of growing action to protect the blue world. The younger ones are stepping up and leading their own environmental efforts and, and also groups, so I think this is very encouraging. Seventeen-year-old student Ryan Chin is one of the new breed of volunteers. He's at Badok Jetty, 
to help run a workshop to teach the public sustainable fishing. But these are the main ones that you get. Right. This comes after he noticed an increase in anglers during the pandemic who weren't all fishing in a responsible way. People just leave fish on the jet ski like that. So I first got into fishing when I was six. Uh, I was in kindergarten at the time and my grandmother brought me fishing to Buluk Jetty. So she had seen the decline of fish populations over time, how the fish were getting fewer and also smaller. So the main reason why she wanted me to put them back is with the idea of, oh, let them grow back and reproduce, which is something that I've come to realise is really important for the ecosystem. Two fingers in front, two behind, just like that. That's the most secure way. You can do this, have this latch, it goes down straight away. So our main stance for the workshop is around first appreciation and then conservation. Appreciation and understanding, oh wow, Singapore has over 500 species of marine fish. Um, let's try to protect them, let's try to document them. And conservation is what naturally follows. After appreciating something, you now love what you know. The workshop uses special hooks without barbs, so the fish aren't hurt. Okay, feel that? Strike, strike. Pull, 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 pull. Oh, you got one? Yes, yes. Here you go. In the basket. Keep it down a bit. They document the catch to share with a local scientific database. It's called a whip tail because um, you can see at the end, it's a whip. Oh, yeah. The tail's like a whip. whip. Yeah. Just hold it properly. Okay. Come, let's get up. And then almost all the fish are released. So it's really a breath of fresh air in my life whenever I go fishing because it's really exploration and really not knowing what you're going to get. But at the same time, I do remember to stop and just enjoy the moment, to enjoy beyond the fish, to enjoy the privilege that we have in Singapore to interact with this biodiversity, to interact with these ecosystems and to interact with the ocean. All oh, right. You can see it swimming around here. Right, like this. Just like this. All right, just make sure that it's right on top of the water. We don't want it to hit anything on the way down. And let's... Bye-bye. Oh, Singapore isn't just a city. It isn't just an urban environment. We actually do have wildlife here. And let's try to protect it. Let's try to steward it. And before we go, we have these maps for you. So you might be wondering where you can fish in Singapore. Right. Here it is. Wonderful. Yep. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank See you so you. much. Take care. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye. Another jetty, another enthusiast trying to capture fish but in a very different way. Nicholas Chu is a marine biologist who takes photos in his spare time. He's heading to an island off Singapore's southern coast. Ever since I was young, I was one of those kids who always watched um, Discovery Channel. Uh, when my peers were watching cartoons, I would be watching Nat Geo. Okay, so here we have our camera set up. Right now I've got a macro lens on, which means we're going to be looking for things that are really small. Fingers crossed that we find something nice today. Nicholas knows the bad weather won't make things easy. Well, I think I'm always up for a challenge. Um, there's a part of me that's really into the technical part of creating a good photograph in difficult conditions. Um, there's also the artistic side to it that is harder to explain. It just brings me joy, I'd have to say. The results speak for themselves. You may just be swimming, and you think you've got a nice rock in front of you, and then this rock just moves and looks at you. You get a bit of a shock, because you can imagine it's just, it's just 50 cm from your face. Yeah, and suddenly it's a turtle. Almost everyone will go, wow, I didn't know we had that. 
and that gives me a chance to share um, a little bit about what we do have and how it's worth protecting. With my photography, I'm hoping to share awareness of the precious natural heritage that we have. Now the oceans are in trouble with climate change, global warming, pollution. You have things happening in the ocean that you don't see, but things are collapsing. And today I have a kid. And my, my, my hope, my sincere hope is that when my kid's old enough to dive and when she's exploring her world, she would see the things that I once saw. To me, we're all connected to the ocean. And um, when I think of blue, I think of where I come from. I think we all start off submerged in our mother's wombs. And somehow when I, when I dive, there, there's that connection just to feel that all around me. So what lies ahead for our vital oceans? So in 15 to 20 years, I hope that our waters can slowly become blue. When you go diving, it's clear blue, you can see the seabed. And then when you look up, you can see the boat. And around you is vibrant. The marine life is thriving. And you can see uh, a lot of different animals that we haven't really encountered frequently, like dolphins or like even dugongs in our waters. So hopefully they can be regular visitors. This is a phrase that I really think is, uh, is amazing. No blue, no green. No water, no life. So really the sea, right, it's, it's, a, it's a basis of life. You need the blue if you want the green. So we need to protect the blue so that we'll always have green around us. And I think that's as simple as it is.